ever hear of lint? No, not lint, lint. Lint you find in your belly button. What we don't say, belly button, sorry. Never mind. We are talking about lint, not lint. On this episode, not episode, of Chuck Knows Church. Lent is observed in the liturgical year for approximately six weeks, uh, considered a time of preparation leading up to Easter. Is this awkward for anyone else? I think we can, I think we're good. Thank you. Ah, uh, in, most, in most Western Protestant churches, Sundays are not counted as part of Lent. So the time from Ash Wednesday until Easter is 40 days when Sundays are excluded. This is to recognize the 40 days that Jesus spent fasting in the desert, where he endured temptations uh, before beginning his public ministry. Now, as we said, Lent is a time to prepare for Easter. In fact, the church focuses on increasing spiritual disciplines such as prayer and repentance or self-denial, uh, like giving up sweets or fatty foods or the mispronunciation of words like Lent. All this provides an example to those preparing to live out the covenant of baptism. Now that's why Lent can also be a time to take on something, a chance to improve yourself, uh, grow spiritually, work on relational or bodily fitness, learn to juggle. Whatever it is you choose to do or not do, it's about enhancing the discipline of the whole body for conversion from sin and death to love and life in Jesus Christ. Now, my favorite part is right before Lent on Shrove Tuesday, AKA Fat Tuesday, the day before Ash Wednesday, and right after No Interesting Nickname Monday. Uh, Fat Tuesday is where we eat up all the good food in the house to prepare for the fasting season of the 40 days of Lent, which always translates to a pancake breakfast at our church. There we go. Can I get a fork? Anyone? A fork? We already did the no. intro Tuesday episode. Okay, can I, did you ever hear of seconds? Before we were born, before we took our first breath, before the week started, before the year started, before we said, I love you, before we said, I'm sorry, before we figured out who we really are, before we figured out who we want to be, before it all, God loved us unconditionally and freely, fully and honestly, God loved us. Again and again, this is where our story begins. Let us worship God. Good morning, Good Shepherd. We are so excited to have you here worshiping with us this morning. There are a few announcements that we want to lift up. The first and the most exciting is that we are returning to in-person worship. So come on, on March 28th, Palm Sunday, we will be open for worship. It's so exciting. Um, you don't have to register. You just come. We are requiring that people wear masks. And this is in a letter that's going to come uh, this week for our newsletter. And then our second is our Holy Week. We have Monday, Thursday. We're going to have a small uh, time of worship at 7 p.m. right here on this platform. 
And then if you are feeling like you want to grab a soup and something warm to snuggle up to as you watch, we are having a soup drive through and that's gonna be at from 5.30 to 6.30, you can pick up, and it's $6. It includes soup, crusty bread, and communion, so you can take communion during service. Um, you can go on our website and go on Facebook to fill out the order form, and then you can just pay when you come to pick up. We are also going to be having a Good Friday service in person, again. Good Friday in person at seven o'clock in the evening. So we hope that you can make it to there. And then of course, he is risen. Easter is going to be at 10.30 a.m. in person and online. Now, if you're not ready to come back to in-person worship, we will be having our platform open. Um, and how we're gonna do that is some exciting things that we'll announce in a few coming weeks. So right now, let's calm our hearts, our bodies, and our minds as we prepare for a time of community and to worship together in Christ. Lord, let me walk each day with Thee. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. I am weak and I need Thy strength and power to help me over my weakest hour. Help me through the darkness thy face to see. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. Lead me, guide me along the way. For if you lead me, I cannot stray. Lord, let me walk each day with thee. Lead me, O oh Lord, lead me. Help me tread in the path of righteousness. Be my aid when Satan and sin oppress. I am putting all of my trust in thee. And now we pause to pray for our lives, for one another, for the world around us. If you have prayer concerns you would like to lift up this day, please do so in the comment section so that we can be praying for one another in our community. Let us go to God together in prayer. Let us pray. God of love, we come this morning recognizing 
that we often forget the beginning of the story, that we were made from love, made to be loved, made to give love. Instead of rooting ourselves in the narrative of the goodness of creation, we skip ahead and find our worth in the fall, with Cain and Abel lost in the wilderness. We forget that first there is you, and that you are love. We forget that out of that love you created us. We forget that from the very first day you loved first. God, we forget because a love like that doesn't make sense to us. So God, forgive us. Forgive our low self-esteem. Forgive our resistance to love ourselves and others. Forgive our hesitation to trust that even we could be made good. And forgive our tendency to pass that doubt on from generation to generation. God, write a new beginning for us that roots our confidence in your unrelenting love. With hope we pray again and again, knowing that no matter what we do, no matter where we go or what we tell ourselves, you are love and you, oh God, love us. You have claimed, held, forgiven, and cared for us. Thank you for that example of love. God of love, as we worship this morning, as your word is read and proclaimed, help us to listen deeply to what it is you are saying to us. God, we long to hear your truth. We long to know your love. So open our hearts and minds this morning. We are ready to listen. God, we pray all of this in your son's holy and precious name as we join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, not that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. 
We're going to start. The, I'm going to do that because I said not, and it shouldn't. That's fine. All right. <laughs> this morning's scripture reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. It's probably one of the most recognizable verses in all of Scripture. You've probably seen it on billboards, on signs, bumper stickers, coffee mugs, t-shirts, you name it. If you grew up memorizing verses, you probably inevitably learned this one. And it's a true statement in and of itself. In fact, Luther called it the Bible in miniature, the gospel in a nutshell. However, like all verses in scripture, I think we miss the fullness of this verse if we just take it by itself. If we don't look at the context, if we don't look at the verses around it and what's going on when it was written. So today, today I want to invite us to take a deeper look at not only this famous verse, but the whole passage that surrounds it, as we seek to understand the fullness of God's love for us, a love that brought God in flesh to us, a love that gave up everything, even life itself, for us, a love that, like grace, is a true gift from God that brings us true life. Because, as the next verse, John three seventeen tells us, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that we might be saved through him. Now today's passage is just part of Jesus' longer conversation with Nicodemus. And as much as we want to think about John 3.16 as fairly straightforward, Jesus' conversation this time with Nicodemus, when this famous piece of scripture is set out, it actually left Nicodemus scratching his head. Now, if you remember the story of Nicodemus, you'll remember that he sought Jesus out in the dark of night. He was drawn to Jesus, even calling Jesus rabbi, saying that he knew Jesus had come from God because of all that he was able to do. But he was also a Pharisee, a member of the Sahedrin, one of the religious leaders among the Jewish people of the time, and a part of the group that were beginning to oppose Jesus himself. Now, Scripture doesn't actually say this, but it's safe to bet that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night in order to keep this conversation a secret. And Jesus uses this time to teach him. Jesus tells him, that to see the kingdom of God, one must be born anew, born from above. Now this only confuses Nicodemus, who takes the statement quite literally, as Jesus is trying to teach him more about the work of the Spirit. Then Jesus makes a reference to Moses and the serpent in the wilderness. Now we probably don't recognize this reference right away, if at all. But as a teacher of Israel, Nicodemus would have known the story immediately. He would have remembered that when the people were wandering through the wilderness, 
the people became impatient. They complained when they couldn't find water. And Moses, through God, was able to provide water from a rock at Meribah. And then they complained that they couldn't find food. And God provided manna, literally food from heaven, to fill their bellies. God freed them from the captivity in Egypt and provided for them in the wilderness. And he even helped them prevail in the battle over the Canaanites right before this passage happens. But it wasn't exactly the life that the people had expected. And in the wilderness, they continued to complain. They spoke out against Moses, against God. And then terrible serpents appeared. And these terrible serpents began to bite people, and people were dying. At this point, the people turn back to God. They go to Moses, asking him to plead with God. And God tells Moses to make a serpent, to set it on a pole, and to raise it up. Anyone who would have looked at the serpent would live. Now, it's a strange story for sure, but Jesus uses this story to help teach what God is doing through him. He says that the Son of Man must be lifted up to eternal life, just as Moses is lifted up by the serpent. God's people were saved by God, but they had to look at the image of that which would have brought them death. In the same way, Jesus was lifted up at the cross, the cross which would become the image of both death and true life. As the light coming into the world, into the darkness, Jesus would expose all that keeps us from God. But this light also shines the path to true life. This light comes not out of judgment or condemnation, but out of God's love, to pull us back, to let us think about all that keeps us hidden, all that keeps us separate from God. Now, there's a lot of different images that come all at once in this passage. We have the Israelites in the wilderness, Moses raising up the serpent, the Son of Man himself being raised, light coming into the world, people loving darkness, people being exposed. There's condemnation and judgment and there's God's love. Wrapped up in the middle of this passage is that famous verse that we started with. Wrapped up in the midst of all this passage is a reminder that all of this, all that happens to the Israelites in the wilderness, to Nicodemus at night, to us throughout our lives, to all of creation, all of it points back to God's love. God loved first. Out of love, God created. Out of love, God chose to be in relationship with us. Out of love, God sent Jesus, God in flesh, to live among us and show us the way back to God. But so often, we don't feel worthy of that love. Or we begin to draw lines on who's in and who's out, on who exactly God came to save. Are they worthy? Are we worthy? Does God loving the world really mean the whole world? That's why I believe this passage needs to be taken in the whole context of the whole story. We need to hear not only that God sent Jesus to us to bring eternal life, but that Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save us. God's love, God's action, and Jesus is purposeful in giving. It's to rescue, to bring us true life. God longs for us to live, and not just to be alive, for our hearts to be pumping, our lungs to be breathing, but to have life. A life that grows us, that challenges us to be who we were created to be, that brings us ever closer to God. And this love, this life, it's available to all. God doesn't want anyone left in the darkness. For all of creation is worthy of salvation. Which means that we have to learn to see ourselves every last one of us as worthy, to realize that God knows us and loves us, even with our flaws and our imperfections, that God loved us before we were born, before we took our first breath, before we recognized God, before we said, I am sorry, before we opened ourselves up to what God was already doing. God loves us. And God gave us his son, chose to dwell in flesh among us out of this love, 
As we've talked about before, Jesus' mission wasn't simply to die. Jesus' mission was to show us the extent of God's love throughout his life, to bring us back to God whatever the cost. Jesus came not to judge us, not to condemn us, for we've all done wrong. Jesus came to draw us away from all that keeps us from God, to show us how life in the fullness of that life is possible with God, and to help us share that good news with all that we meet. Now, something I think we need to notice, God didn't ask for permission before sending Jesus. God loves us, whether we like it or not, whether we feel worthy of that love or we don't. One of the commentaries I was reading this week, there's a story about a man putting his six-year-old son to bed. Now, the little boy didn't want to go to bed yet. He was frustrated and upset, and he told his dad, Daddy, I hate you. Well, the dad responded by telling him, I'm sorry you feel like that, but I love you. Now the son pushed back, don't say that. I'm sorry, but it's true. I love you, was the dad's response. The son protested, don't, don't say that again. The dad ended this back and forth by saying, I love you. Like it or not, I love you. Now, the boy was upset. Maybe he was trying to control his dad's love, to manipulate it to get what he wanted. Maybe he just didn't feel worthy that day. But the fact was, there wasn't a bargaining chip in this love. His father's love was unconditional. Now, God's love for us is like that. God's love for us is unconditional. It's gracious, it's giving, it's undeserved, and it's free. We can choose to embrace God's love or we can run from it. But we can't manipulate it, we can't control it. And God will continue to chase after us, seeking to call us back to him to redeem us all. Whether we like it or not, whether we feel worthy or not, whether we embrace it or not, God loves us. John 3.16 tells us that God loves us and sent Jesus to bring us back to him, doing whatever it takes. John 3.17 pushes us further, reminding us that all of creation is worthy of salvation, whether we feel worthy or not. God isn't going to let our own worries, fears, and judgments of what we do or don't deserve keep us from loving us, keep him from loving us. But God is going to push us into the light, push us to see what might be keeping us from him. As the light of the world, as the one lifted up, Jesus came to help us recognize not only who God is and who we might be in God, but also to shine a light on all that keeps us from God, that we might step out of the darkness, let go of all of our judgments, and turn towards God. So our challenge this Lenten season, as we continue to walk with Jesus towards the cross, is to really reflect on what things might be keeping us from fully embracing that love. As Jesus lights up the world, what do you see holding you back? And beyond yourself, what might be keeping you from sharing that love with others? Knowing that Jesus' work wasn't about judgment or division between who was in and who is out, but about opening the doors wider that we might all know that this love is available to us if we only turn to God. Now, I want to end today by thinking back once again to Nicodemus. Now, we're not told how Nicodemus left this conversation, but it wouldn't surprise me if he left that night more confused than when he arrived. He came in the darkness, still letting the things of this world keep him from fully embracing God's truth. Jesus shined the light of God's love in front of him, but he still left that night in darkness. But we know that wasn't the end of Nicodemus' story. We know that only a few chapters later, he's calling out the other Sanhedrin, reminding them that they are called to hear the truth before judging. And when he saw Jesus lifted up on the cross at the crucifixion, 
Nicodemus knew God's love. For he came with the customary embalming spices, and he assisted Joseph in placing Jesus in the tomb on that dark day. Jesus hadn't given up on him. Instead, he shined a light on everything that was keeping Nicodemus from fully embracing God. Jesus had reminded him and reminds us that we might not be perfect, but we are worthy of God's love. Not because of anything we've done, but because God loved us first. Have you embraced this love as Nicodemus finally did at the cross? Amen.
And now it is my great joy to send you forth with our Linton benediction. As you leave this space, may your mouth speak of God's goodness. May your arms hold those in need. May your feet walk toward justice. May your heart trust its worth. May your soul dance in God's grace. And may this be your rhythm again and again and again until God's promised day. In the name of the lover, the beloved, and love itself, go with courage, go with heart, go in peace. Amen. Thank you.